Hi, this is Bob Devaney. Tonight here for the Wallingford's 350 Moments. Mm. To my left, I have Tarn Granucci, Jerry Farrell to my right, and Bob Beaumont. And this is another edition of the History of Wallingford, and we're starting with the 350 Moments. And Jerry, you want to take first place on this? Well, we've been talking about some of these great chapters in Wallingford's history. And, you know, we think of Wallingford as the way it is today in, you know, 2019. Oh, it must have always been this way. We must have always had, you know, all the great things that we have. One of the greatest things that Wallingford does possess is its public utilities, the electric, the water, the sewer, things like the fire department. How do we get there? Um, And I guess it would be helpful, you know, both to those of us who have been around a while and to people who have come more recently, you know, Mm. You trace Wallingford back to this wilderness that 38 families came and settled in 1670. They didn't come out with their Winnebago camper, um, plug into their battery, um, and suddenly everything was hunky-dory. They came out into a wilderness um, that was populated by wild animals and you know, all kinds of other things. It was a true wilderness. And they settled on North and South Main Street. They divided the land that's on North and South Main Street today up into six-acre lots. And that's where Wallingford really starts. That's really the, the spark, the genesis for the town. But over time, I mean, it developed to be so much more than just that little you know, area of town, that it was an agrarian town to begin with. So when you're in the farming business, you need land. You need as much land as you can get. So over time, during that period after 1670, um, the town allotted more and more agricultural land that if you were a farmer here, they would give you a farm lot and a wood lot so that you would be able to be self-sufficient largely for you and your family. And the town grows to the point where um, originally our borders included Meriden and Cheshire. Mm. And by the 1730s, you know, people had moved out to those parts of the town to the point where separate parishes were founded, that the congregational Mm -hmm. church situated in the, the center of Wallingford needed to have outposts in Meriden and Cheshire. So in the 1730s, those happen. Over time, the town gets developed, particularly during the mid to late 19th century, that industry comes to town, and we have a lot more modern needs, let's call them that, of we need sanitation, we need sewers, we need public water, we need electricity. And that's, I think, the, the start of the modern age for Wallingford is sort of that late 19th century that we say, uh, we don't want outhouses anymore, we want indoor plumbing. Mr. Beaumont, I think you've had a lot to do with that kind of thing, haven't oh, you? Oh, I have. But uh, actually, one thing that actually starts in, in conjunction with needing water, needing you know, for sanitation, etc., one of the biggest needs for water was for fire department and which actually the fire department actually predates the utilities and with that in mind i'm swinging over to tarn because but with all the with all the services that were coming Mm -hmm. to need because of all the people that Mm -hmm. were coming into wallingford Mm -hmm. and moving from say the new haven area we needed a fire department because of all the land that wallingford encompassed so tarn why don't you give us a little information about the history of the wallingford fire department well fire goes way back and fire has been around forever And when those first 38 families settled into their homes, there might have been some fires that got out of control very quickly. And so they all agreed that they would keep buckets with a, what they call a piggin handle on them in their homes, full of water at all times. In that, those could be used to put out a fire in their own house, or if there were a fire in the neighborhood, maybe everybody would come running with their bucket. And that was the system that they used for about 60 years. And apparently it worked well enough, but then there were more homes, more people 
more risks of fire. And um, in 1831, um, a, a, and this happened at, behind the Congregational Church, a crude fire engine was constructed, which was basically a wooden box with wheels on it full of water. Fairly crude, but it worked. And that's what was on uh, hand at that time for the next 25 years or so until 1854, when the borough of Wallingford bought something called the Aconant, which was a, right. a really sophisticated fire engine. Right. And that's, um, that carried us forward another 50 years or so until um, 1913, the first motorized uh, fire engine was purchased and put to use in town. And that was under the guidance of Chief John Luby. So now we started to have people involved in preventing fires through all these equipments and, and protecting the various parts of town. I'm a people person, so when I wrote my book, Legendary Locals, I was interested in about the people of Wallingford, and I learned about um, Peter Struble, our most recent fire chief, before uh, Chief Heidgerd, who is the chief now. And then recently we had a story in the Wallingford Magazine about the 150-year mm -hmm. anniversary of the fire department. And I got to know um, Chief Struble and got taken through the whole process of the fire department. And it's, it's pretty amazing how it's evolved from buckets of water to throw on a fire to what can be done today. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But I wanted to share that in my lifetime, my first experience with a fire was in 1963 when my father's furniture store burned down on the corner of North Orchard Street and Center. Well, it's true that downtown Wallingford has had quite a few fires over the years, especially when we were kids in the 60s. And I had an uncle, Bill Canning, who was in the fire service for many, many years, and he was stationed on Wallace Company over on South Cherry Street. And actually, well, I believe the Wallace uh, Company that was down there was involved with Tibbetts Company up mm -hmm. on North Main Street yep. and various other fire companies around town. People actually tell people about how many fire companies we did have around town. Well, I'm getting to that. I just wanted to say that I found my way downtown when I found out my father's store was burning. And I ran from where I lived up off Long Hill Road and uh, got there and found the fire was under control and the building was full of firemen carrying out the furniture and everything they could carry out to salvage from the fire. The firemen were doing this. So I developed an early appreciation for what firemen do besides hold a hose and put out the fire. And there were other fires over the years downtown and, and throughout other parts. Well, it's very true. But back in the 60s, uh, downtown Wallingford really took a a hard hit with fires. And of course, the W.T. Grant Company, <clears throat> Burns mm -hmm. Sykes Libby was yep. on fire, um, the old Central Hotel, mm -hmm. and also, um, well, the gas station next door that was um, Mr. Ors. Andy Orr's uh, yep. gas station. And you know, as a kid, I remember sitting over on Dr. Spignacy's uh, porch watching the, watching the firemen do their diligent duties. So mm -hmm. continue. Yep. We ended up having five volunteer fire departments throughout town, um, and they were people at that time, I think all men who got together and were available should there be a fire and they'd have their equipment. Um, one that started in Tracy was interesting. It started out as a social club and that evolved into being a volunteer fire department. Today we have four fire departments. We have the one on North Main Street. We have the um, central headquarters up on Masonic off the Hartford Turnpike. Uh, the, the Yalesville Fire Department was merged with North Farms now and they just built this incredible huge new building there. It's state of the art. Uh, and then we have the volunteer fire department, uh, the East Wallingford, which is on Kondraki Lane. There's so many people involved uh, in the fire department. And, and when I toured with Chief Heidgerd, the, one, the headquarters over on Masonic, I was shown so much equipment that can do so many things. And what I also learned is that most of their calls that come in now are not for fires. They're for health yeah, things, because yeah, this, this now we have the, um, the ambulance services under the umbrella of the fire department. So um, the equipment for everything that's conceivable is, is beyond belief and costs a lot of money. The aerial fire truck cost a million dollars, a million dollars for one truck. The, and uh, I remember when they were 200000 Yeah. <laughs> And the pumper truck was $600,000. And then all of these high-tech high equipment pieces are there. So the people are a huge piece of it. O always were, always have been, always will be. It's the people who care so much, who are willing to volunteer. And then we have a lot of career firefighters who are here 
to do the right thing, and they're they're tr highly trained. They're, the training is long and tedious. You have to learn a lot to be professional because now they have to deal with things like cars that run off a highway, and they have to get mm -hmm. there and save the people from the car and figure out how to open it and on and on. So there's there's so much to know. But in terms of the people, I wanted to share something. This is Chief Hydrid's book of uh, Wallingford Fire Department um, since 1856. And this is The Fireman's Prayer. And it's by an unknown author, but it says so much about these people who are protecting our homes, our businesses, and our lives. When I am called to duty, God, wherever flames may rage, give me strength to save some life, whatever be its age. Help me embrace a little child before it is too late or save an older person from the horror of that fate. Enable me to be alert and hear the weakest shout, and quickly and efficiently to put the fire out. I want to fill my calling and to give the best in me, to guard my every neighbor and protect his property. And if, according to my fate, I am to lose my life. Please bless with your protecting hand my children and my wife. Well, it's interesting. You talked about people, people in the fire service. And, and I, I think back at a lot, we talked about the different fire departments. Uh, you know, East Wallingford really started up on, Long, up on Warren Hill Road. Sure. And it took people to make these fire departments. Mm -hmm. It took the farmers. It took uh, people like Crump and Craniac up on Warren Hill. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, fire department moved down to Kondraki Lane. Uh, and then you look over at North Farms. Now, um, Mr. Wilkinson, the Wall Boys, that whole crew up there took care of that North Farms area. You had mm -hmm. Tracy, you had Yalesville, and let's not forget Cook Hill. You had down the Wallace Company again and also Tibbetts and then the main fire department. So without these people, mm -hmm. it's people that make it work. It is. Without these people, mm -hmm. It's people that make it work. It is. Bob, your turn. Taking a look at the um, taking a look at the utilities we have here. There, the first time anything gets mentioned about water or sewer, uh, it's about 1870, and one of the reasons that it did is Dr. Benjamin Franklin Harrison, for whom Harrison Park was later named, was a local doctor. He served in the um, in the in an infantry brigade in. New York during the Civil War. And I say in New York, a New York brigade, I should say, in South Carolina. Spent about a year and a half in that and then was appointed as the sanitation director for South Carolina and Florida. I don't know what happened to Georgia, but it was just those two states. So when he came back after the war, um, he started lobbying actually for sanitary facilities, would be it for municipal water or be it for that matter for sewage to be handled properly. 1870, uh, 1871 time frame, there's a committee that's set up. He chairs it along with friend Miller, who was an industrialist here in town with Samuel Simpson. Uh, and that's when they first start talking about having municipal water. And the primary reason for municipal water was not just the water for the residences, it was water for the manufacturers, and but primarily it was water for the fire department. The houses were close together, house catches on fire. You know, you've got to you need to be able to put put the fire out. The industrialists particularly were interested in having water for the fire department. Mm. This was discussed, they, they came up with a plan in 1871 as to what would work for potential waterworks. Uh, they thought it would cost about $50,000 at the time, which was serious money. Mm. Um, excuse me, nothing, however, got done. Well, if it tends to do mm -hmm. things in a measured manner, uh, we don't jump into things right away. Uh, sometimes that's good, sometimes that may not be. Fast forward about 10 years, we get to 1880. There is a major fire at the Wallingford Wheel Company, which, is, which was on the corner of what is now known as North Cherry Street and Hall Avenue. The Wallingford Wheel Company burned to the ground. I believe at that point, that, as much as anything else, served as the impetus to get the charter changed to allow for Wallingford to have its own municipal water and also to have its own municipal sewer. 
This had to be a change in the charter, uh, which was affected in 1881-1882 time frame in Hartford. And that is how really we got into the sewage and the water utility business. Uh, sewers, um, the sewers included both storm sewer and sanitary sewer. Now you get in the center of town, the borough, and keep in mind everything here is with regard to the borough initially, not the town. It's strictly the inner portion of the town, which is where the bulk of the people are at that point. How do you take care of things such as uh, refuse from outhouses, etc.? I live on a half acre lot. My neighbor lives on a half acre lot, or may, maybe less. You have you both have outhouses. It can get to be very unpleasant. How do you how do you how do you handle your wells? Well, they started paving roads with stone, some cobblestone or bro broken broken rock. They also started putting in sewer lines, primarily initially for uh, storm sewer. They had their catch basins in, in many of the streets, be it Center Street, be it Church Street, be it Main Street, various others. And they also had sewer laterals going to the houses. The well, many of the wells were getting to be contaminated because of the outhouses. One interesting little thing, there was an ordinance back in 1881 that came about, it was adopted and stipulated that citizens were forbidden to clean their privies, or if you will, outhouses, on certain days during, between April and October, between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. And I'm not sure when, you know, I guess there were certain days it was okay to go ahead and clean them, but they weren't allowed to go through the streets of the town. So what happened with the sewage? The sewage went down into open trenches down in the sand plains that, uh, that adjoined the Quinnipiac River. Mm -hmm. The solids would accumulate along the sides, and the liquid would go into the river, untreated. The farmers would come along, they would take the uh, solids, and they would use that for fertilizer. It may not sound very pleasant, but is it really that much different than using cow manure or other types of things? It's, it's, mm. But that is what they did. All right. Going onward, during the course of the next 15 years or so, we had sewers on, you know, roughly from Christian Street on the north to Ward Street on the south, going as far east as Elm Street and as far west as, as Washington. So the core center of the town was covered. That year, they extended sewers to, to a number of, of other streets, you know, down along both south and north Cherry, to more on Ward Street, Bartholomew, which later became Franklin, so that they, they were continually doing this. And I might say the, the, the records in the sewer division are somewhat sketchy in terms of some of the older history. Fast forward to about 1925, and we had our first sewer treatment plant. All that did was it was primary treatment. What does that mean? That means that they went ahead and the solids would, were, were allowed to, you know, were separated out. They were fil filtered out. The sludge was removed, and the fluid went into the, into the Quinnipiac, or the effluent, if you will. The plant basically uh, you know, worked pretty well. The plant in 1925 cost $50,000 to build. A few years later, they expanded it in 1934, and... Then, in, by about 20 years later, the state sort of got on us and said, look, you really have to do something about dumping things into the Quinnipiac. You, you've got to treat this stuff. So formed a town-wide sewer authority. And I say town-wide because heretofore everything has strictly been the borough. By 1958, we were about to get a consent order that we either had to go ahead and come up with a better treatment plant and stop polluting the Quinnipiac, or, we would, or there would be a consent order directing us to do so. We chose to go ahead and do it ourselves. So we put in a five, five million gallon a day plant, and we also had an industrial portion. So we had two portions. We had a two, two million gallon a day industrial portion and a five million gallon residential or sanitary sewer. And that, that worked pretty well. Uh, the, the industrial ones went in, uh, such as Wallingford Steel, Wallace Silversmiths, International Silver, which is now where Amphenol is and, and the Judd Company, none of which exists today, now that we look at it a half century later. But in 1960, they were the ones that were added in. 
and by the way, it was about 1960 also that we stopped or split up, if you will, the sanitary and the storm sewer. Fast forward into the 1980s, early 1980s, we ended up, because of capacity problems, we ended up having to have a moratorium on building within the, the area that was served by the sewers. 1989, we put in an 8 million gallon a day plant, which is what is down there today. That handles both the industrial and the residential. The only thing it didn't at the time, it did not handle SciTech. SciTech, because of the chemicals that they put in, had their own wastewater treatment plant, as they still do today. Um, We've actually really come a long way. Oh, we have come a long that. way. Yeah. We've, we've gone into second, we've gone on not just primary, but secondary and tertiary treatment. We're now treating for, you know, for phosphorus. Well, we're, we are treating for phosphorus. We're about to, we're looking at a, the p potential of a $55 million plant to go ahead and take, and it's an, up, it's an upgrade to the plant. And this is only one component of the plant. Hmm. The plant as it went in back in the late 50s, early 60s, was about $2 million. The original plant was... 50,000. Now we're up to 55 million, mm. and that's not the total plant. Mm. Wow. When, did our, when did our electric division start, Bob? Well, electric division actually started in um, 1899. They started talking about it in 1890, and really what was there is a comment got made, well, what if it's the only town of its size in New England that doesn't have its own, that does not have electricity? They said Wallingford does things in a measured manner. There was, you know, they had various meetings of, uh, from 1891 on uh, Colonel Leavenworth and um, Leverett Hubbard, who was a judge and also at one point was Secretary of State, um, were involved with the Wallingford Gaslight Company. And they made a proposal to go ahead and provide lamps to along the streets for $5,000 a year for 50 of them, I believe it was. Well, there was quite a to-do about that, and uh, a number of people did not like the gas company. They figured the gas company was making too much money, that these guys were just getting rich. And Leverett Hubbard said, he said, no. He said, not only am I not getting rich, he said, I put 1,200 of my own money into this to go ahead and keep, just keep it running. Well, that didn't stop the battling. Um, a, few, a couple of years later, uh, one attorney Hall, uh, Father Mallon of the Holy Trinity Church, and a couple of other gentlemen came up with the idea of a Wallingford Electric Tramway Light and Power Company. The next day, the next day, mind you, Colonel Leavenworth and Judge Hubbard and Gurdon Hall, who was involved with the Wallingford Gaslight Company, said, oh, we'll come up, we'll have, an ex we'll have an electric trolley system that we'll put in. It died. Nothing happened for a few years. Um, Finally, in 1894, 1895, and beyond is when they really started working to get the charter changed in Hartford to allow for the electric, you know, to have, a, to have an electric utility run by the town. First proposal was it was going to cost 15000 for it. For, well, that was, and then maybe 4000 a year to go ahead and run. Didn't cover a lot of stuff. We had a more of a local engineer come up with something. He figured it was going to be forty-five thousand, about eleven thousand a year to to run it, which was actually far more reasonable. Far more, when I say reasonable, from the perspective of being able to do it. So, in eighteen ninety-nine, we bonded the town, the borough, I should say, bonded forty-five thousand and started to build a plant. And something of, of great importance happened on October second of eighteen ninety-nine. We hired a gentleman by the name of Alfred L. Pierce, a 31-year-old engineer from up in, at this point, up in Frank Franklin, Mass. And he was going to be the superintendent. And folks, he was going to get paid the princely sum of $85 a month, or some $1,020 a year, mm -hmm. to start and run the electric <clears throat> utility. Well, the plant on Washington Street went into operation in 1899 at, at the end of the year. That's now where, where folks today would know that area as the Wallingford Senior Center and the building that was part of what is there now. You know, not, now it's Scow, the Spanish community of Wallingford. And the interesting thing is for the first two months, the 36 customers who had their electricity turned on, on as a Christmas present, basically, and on 12-22 of 1899, first two months they got their electricity free until, until it was turned over to the town. One thing they they used John P. Stevenson's store, which is the, 
where Teeny Bank is today at, at Simpson Court, he had electricity as one of the first 36 customers. He was also the first chairman of the, of the Electric Commission. A few years later, they decided that they needed more um, generating power than what they had at the plant uh, at, on Washington Street, and they decided to purchase water rights from, from the Hotchkiss brothers down on the Quinnipiac, just north of, of Telly's Road. They, made, they built a small hydroelectric plant. However, they kept a, the gristmill running. Mr. One of the Hotchkiss brothers continued running the gristmill. Actually, the first time that they used the hydro plant was 1907, and that was for the opera house that was in, on the third and fourth floor of uh, the um, Simpson, of Sim, Simpson Block. The, over the years, needless to say, it grew. Uh, the, you know, the demand grew. During World War I, there was a major problem of shortage of coal. Mr. Pierce went around to the businesses and asked them, please, turn off the lights you don't need. Just use as few lights as you can. Well, in spite of 24-7 uh, factories running and all, they managed to get through it. By 1923, however, they were in serious trouble. They did not have enough generating capacity between the hydro plant and the and the units on Washington Street to handle things. So they initially went to CLNP, and Connecticut Light and Power ended up selling electricity to them for the next, well, altogether the next 70 years. But uh, they, so we stopped generating in 1923. Fast forward through the Second World War, you know, we here again, hard time there in terms of getting things. We asked the customers to please, those in the outlying areas, would you send your meter readings in so we can save on tires, tire wear, and on gasoline because they were not available that much during the war. It's amazing, Bob, this, uh, the PUC and the water division, the sewer division, electric division has a rich history. <clears throat> and I believe Wallingford is very, very fortunate mm -hmm. to have those organizations mm -hmm. taking care of things. Uh, Jerry, a couple seconds to wrap up. Well, Bob mentions Alfred Pierce. People in Wallingford should thank the, their lucky stars that Alfred Pierce was for Absolutely. decades the general manager of the electric division. Mm -hmm. It's so apropos, the plants named after him. I remember hearing that he would literally, as the general manager, climb the pole mm -hmm. wow. and change the wow. light bulbs. Sure that, that's the frugal way yeah. that the Wallingford Electric Division has been run, still to this day, that's and amazing. everybody benefits from yeah. it. Absolutely amazing. All right. Couple of comments before Nicola quits. It's a great town. It's evolved and grown so wonderfully well. And even today, when we have problems with Mother Nature, our utilities take care of us all so beautifully over and over and over. Very fortunate to have the utilities. We're very fortunate to have a great highway department, public works department, and totally everything. So, and, and it makes Wallingford an attractive place Absolutely. that when you Go back to 1670 and then come forward. Mm -hmm. We're an attractive place because the forethought of all these people to add these services. And again, the and keep one thing in mind, and keep one thing in mind. With the electric, we've got the lowest rates in the state. That That's was true. Not always the case. And it comes down to the people. Remember can, that. It's the people right. that make it's it happen. The people. The, yep. people that, the people that work that work down at the utilities are absolutely phenomenal. So on behalf of Wallingford's 350th Moments Committee, I want to thank, great deal of thank goes out, thanks goes out to Susan, Tom, and Bruce and the staff of WPAA for allowing us to be here tonight to present to you and get ready for the next edition of Wallingford's 350 Minutes. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.